Friend of mine is in the middle seat, just got one of those waist seat belts, and he's just hanging like this from the ceiling. Uh, so I grew up in quite a rural area in, up in North Wales. The first car I had, it was a Vauxhall Nova 1.5 diesel. I bought it for £50. And I did, this was the time of like Need for Speed Underground. So I've done weight reduction. I've taken the back seats out. I've taken anything that can come off it, off it, just to make it as light as possible. Uh, and we just rally it around fields and just, you know, it was a time where I, I was that young that I thought, you know, if you wanted to go quicker, you'd go into higher gears. So I'd just leave it in second and just redline it. And when it would overheat, we'd bring it back into the yard and just mist it with the hose to cool it down right apparently you're not supposed to do that so yeah you know I've, I've had a bit of an experience with some old cars and stuff so by the time i came to sort of 14 15 i'd have these sort of cabin parties on the farm there and all my kind of teenage friends would come down and we'd have these great parties down by the river and at that age now you, you've got a couple of friends who are a little bit older than you who can now start to drive at 17. one of these guys had a citroen saxo vts now anyone at the time would tell you that the vts was like nothing could beat it, right? These these teenagers in the UK, it was like the Saxo VTS was the Ferrari Enzo of cars. Anyway, it was a pretty nippy car. And one morning after one of our sort of cabin parties, we were driving it around sort of the car park at, at my farm and stuff. And I jumped in, in behind the wheel and I was like, oh, let's go for a spin. So there's me and four of the teenage lads. Uh, we're all 14, 15, and we go bombing down these back roads. Now, I remember the naivety of thinking like, there's probably nothing around the corner, so you just go real fast. And these are little farm lanes, and they're you know they're paved. And we're shooting along these back roads, and we get all the way up to about halfway to our local town, and we turn around, uh, and then start to come back down. It's downhill back, so we go a little bit quicker. So you know we're hitting speeds of like 60, 70 mile an hour, which is just absolutely insane on these roads where you know you've got a couple of inches between the wing mirror and walls and trees. And there's this long straight that comes down with a slight kink. I remember to this day coming down the hill and being like, there's probably nothing around the corner. There was something around the corner. There was a car coming the other way. So the car comes the other way and I'm just plant my foot on the brake pedal. The wheels all lock up and it's just eh, screeping like that. I'm like, I'm going to hit this car. So I've just had to, at the last minute, just touch it like that. I've skimmed the wing of this car. I think it was a Volvo in front of me and clipped it. Good job I didn't crash into the Volvo. It would have ended me. And it's gone into the field and flipped straight up onto its roof. A friend of mine is in the middle seat, just got one of those waist seat belts, and he's just hanging like this from the ceiling. And uh, the music's still blaring on the radio, and it's just like, oh my God, right? We, we, so we're all tr struggling to undo our belts because we're hanging upside down from this car. We all sort of crawl out. There's not a mark on us, right? We're not a scuff, nothing. The window's all smashed. The car's completely written off. It's on its roof in this field. The cows are coming round to sort of sniff us and have a look what's going on. We've taken out like 30, 40 feet of fence. And there's a huge oak tree that if we'd gone a few feet more, we would have been straight into the oak tree. And the woman who gets out of the car we've nearly hit is like, are you okay? And we're like, yeah, yeah, fine. Just trying to brush it off. Yeah, it's fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. And I've clipped sort of her fender there and taken out her indicator. And I was like, look, I live down the road. Uh, she, she knew my family. I was like, you know, I, just, just, I was like, just go. Just like, can we just not, I don't want to deal with this right now. I'm just panicking. My friends are all calling out the car. She says, yeah, I'm a bit late for work. I've got to go. Turns out her son had done the same thing 20 years earlier. And she had huge sympathy and didn't phone the police. So we're like three, three miles from home. So we start walking back, which then turns into a bit of a run, which is now a full-on panic sprint. Now, the guy who owns this car is still passed out in this cabin after this party. He doesn't know that I've just written off his pride and joy. And he'd spent a lot of money and time on this car. You know, what you could do in those days, you know, fancy little lights. And it was the full sort of max power era of cars. And I'm running back. And my plan is I'm going to get the tractor from the farm, get the car out of the field, back on its wheels, get it home, dig a hole and bury it, right? This is the plan. Plan A. We can do this, right? We'll just bury it. And then I don't, I hadn't really thought past that about what would, what we do. I don't know. So I'm running back home. My dad's tractor's there. He's, he's literally had it delivered from Germany like a week before. It's still got stickers on the tires, like on the treads of the tires. That's how new this tractor is. I jump in it again, no license. I shouldn't even be driving the tractor, never mind a car. Jump in that with a load of chains, bomb down the road. We managed to get the car out of the field and back onto its wheels. And words got out that a car's been in a crash on the back roads. So next thing, my dad's coming up with some farm worker and comes up and he hits the roof because, you know, being a father now, it's like, 
you've nearly killed you and four of your friends in something so stupid and idiotic. The next month of my life, I don't really remember because I was in a dark room for pretty much all of it. It was just insane. So unfortunately, I couldn't bury the car in time. Words got out. The guy who owns the car is is back in the cabin. He's now like, oh, where's my car? I'd like to go home. And I have to kind of tell him with tears running down my face, oh, it's broken, the car is broken, <laughs> right? So was that was a bit of an awkward moment. I don't really remember how it sort of ended, to be honest. Uh, I think we like my friends and I just sort of denied they were even in the car, although there's some great photos of them sort of sitting on the roof of this written off Saxo while we've got the tractor there. It's like moments before it hits the fan, if you know what I mean. We're all there, it's like, we're all still on a high. We've got mute. The radio still works. It's the only thing that works. And we're like, listen to a bit of music and we're just gathering the bumpers and stuff. And we've got this great photo of us all just kind of sitting in front of the car, like, oh, uh, until, uh, you know, realization sort of hits. And then I had to go back and fix the fence as part of the punishment for the neighbor. So I'm there banging the post by hand and the staples of this fence. And in Welsh rugby, there's a legend called JP, right? And he's a really famous rugby player. It'd be like your Tom Brady. And unbeknownst to me, he was friends with one of our neighbors up the road. And my dad was like, oh my God, right? And the shame, this woman who's up the road was my French teacher and my French name was Zinedine, right? And you know when they say like, we're not angry, we're just disappointed. My French teacher came down with this rugby legend that my dad was like, oh, oh, oh. And my dad had to kind of explain what we were doing. And the French teacher looked at me and went, Zinadine, and I was like, "Oh God, it cut me so deep." I was like, "That was the worst." Yeah, yeah. My French teacher just looking at me in shame, just like shame. When I went to university for the three fifty Z, I bought a, and I love this, a nineteen ninety one Mercedes one ninety E manual, right? One point eight liter, quite rare, sunroof. I love this car, right? I was in university and I dropped my uh, girlfriend off at the time at the train station. I was coming back to university in a rural area again in the the Midlands of England. And uh, there's a big tractor and combine sort of baler thing coming down the road. And it's a long straight road. And I go, I'll overtake him. So I go and overtake him, come along. And as I'm level, my B pillar is level with his front wheel. He just turns into the field because the car's quite low and just pushes me right over and pins me against this like stone old medieval pillar. And I'm like, fine, not a mark on me. He like, it pushes me past it. He does like a three point turn and then pulls into the field out of the way. And then, like, panic again. I don't know, the young... I'm insured. I'm allow allowed to drive. He's like, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, fine, yeah, fine. And drive this crabbed car back to university. Just don't get his details, nothing. He's completely at fault. Drive home uh, to the university, pull up into the yard. And I'm just like, my car's completely written off. It's gone. Like, it's properly crabbed like this. So my mate's like, well, you'll have to drive it home, won't you? So I drove it, like, 80 mile, like this. The whole way, people looking at me at lights and everything like that, it ran. Even 20 years ago in the UK, that's not allowed. This isn't like the backwaters of Tennessee, for example. I think I was just very lucky. We had a little um, we had a little Daihatsu truck and it would run on red diesel. It'd be like a farm license, right? Shouldn't really leave the fields. And I would like take it out and go across town and just by chance never ever saw a police officer and, you know, go to, to the local, meet a girlfriend or something like that. I mean, when I was 15, I took my dad's tractor. This was before the crash to our local town, which is about 17 miles away, clubbing. So I took this John Deere tractor and I'm all dressed up now. You can imagine what I look like in 2005 with like, you know, metallic denim jeans and a G-Star raw top, right? And I'm in this North Wales nightclub town and I'm trying to park this tractor with the orange flashing light on. Like, yeah, it's party time because that's the only way I could get there. There's no buses, there's no taxi that's going to pick me up. And I was like, yeah, I can drive it because I can drive it. The, the legalities of it, I didn't really understand them. So ignorance was sort of bliss there. But yeah, the, the tractor on a nightclub is, it's not a very good pulling machine, a John Deere tractor, in terms of pulling women. Great for pulling material. <laughs> but yeah, I, it wasn't like, you know, I guess if you had a Lamborghini or something, you'd flash your keys at some young girls. A John Deere key doesn't have the same effect. Maybe it does in the States, but it definitely doesn't have it in the UK. Successful car purchasing is all about knowing your buying power and being able to move quickly. And the best way to do that is getting pre-qualified with Premier Financial Services. Call one of these numbers, speak to one of their representatives, fill out their application, and then you'll know exactly how much car you can buy. You'll approach a seller, tell them you're already qualified, you've got your simple lease set up from Premier Financial, and you'll be able to close very, very quickly. That's why Premier is one of the most powerful partners in the world of exotic car financing, and that's why I turn to them every time I go out and try to buy something crazy.